All right, HBCU football fans, welcome to the next episode of the Black College Experience Podcast. I am Derek Thomas, one half of your team covering HBCU sports for Black College Experience. And we have in Atlanta, a CEO of Black College Experience, the one and only Keisha Kelly. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to another week of Black College Experience. are tuning in and you want to call in and roll with us, give us a call here at 719-373-6861. That PIN number is 49170. Of course, you've got to download those apps if you want to listen to us on one of our six places. So, of course, there's Spreaker, Spotify, uh, iTunes, Apple iTunes, uh, podcast rather, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio and CastBox so you can download those apps and you can listen to us right now live yes you can ladies and gentlemen so tune in with us roll with us call in with your questions comments and opinions we want everybody's opinion not just ours so this is your show so call in Um, before we jump into football action we had a pro contract signing Definitely want to highlight this young lady because she represented the swag with such class, grace, uh, and athleticism as she wowed opponents with quadruple doubles. But she wasn't drafted or signed by the WNBA and kind of a disappointment. But she does get her chance to prove herself overseas, and that is Grambling Shakala Hill. So, Kev, talk about. You know, Shakala Hill signed her a pro contract overseas, and what and what that means to her and to Grambling and to just HBCU fans as a whole. Um, I think that it is a very great thing for, um, you know, for her. Um, she did talk about how she didn't get the opportunity, or she wasn't going to get the opportunity you know, to uh, that she wasn't drafted and that she wasn't playing for the WNBA, but she was fine with that and that that was part of her story. And that's one of the things that um, I liked about it because it, it's her way, the way she wants it. Even though it didn't happen how she thought it was going to happen, it still happens where she's going to be going to play uh, overseas in Serbia. So I think um, it's, a, it's a great thing. Um, it's a great thing not only for her, for Grambling, but for other HBCU athletes. And I made this comment the other day on Twitter. Um, so everybody that supports HBCU athletics, uh, you know, um, and that, that understand and knows that it's not just NFL, NBA, MLB. There are so many other levels and ways to go into pro sports and to see her get a shot and so many others get a shot um, to play basketball overseas They make some great money, so I'm really um, excited for her. And who knows, she might actually come back and get into the WNBA. So I have no doubt when you get this kind of um, exposure and you're getting this kind of – and for people that don't know, when LeBron says something about you and you're getting trended, that show that you're really doing something. So this is major, not only for her and Grambling, but this is also major for HBCUs as a whole. Yeah, I, I, and here's the thing. I'm I'm very surprised she wasn't even really given a chance to make it in the WNBA because, I mean, she's a talent. I mean, you don't just average a quad double without being talented. And I know they're trying to look at the, t- the type of competition that she's playing against. But overseas, they're about to find out exactly what kind of basketball player Shakali Hill is. Um, and WNBA better take notice. And you're right, Kills. They can make good money playing overseas, but some people will rather play home in front of their family and friends because, you know, when you're playing overseas, you know, you can't really, you don't really have your family there to support you. And, you know, it's, it's like you on a a work vacation, so to speak. You know what I mean? Right. And I think that's one of the things, like, you know, everybody – And I I read an article earlier talking about the importance. Now, I wasn't – I played basketball for a little while, but I really wasn't a basketball player. I was in band, and I I I did so many things as a young young person in high school, middle school. And I've always been this outgoing person, and I've always been like my mother as to where my sister was – my sister was more – my twin sister was more reserved, and she was more laid back like my dad. 
And so I was reading where they were saying that it's important for parents to go to kids' games and go to their extracurricular activities. It's like you have no clue what that does um, to a to a child's person, to their sight. You have no idea what that does to somebody, period. And I think about that because even at 38, almost 39 years old, I'm getting ready to graduate on October 5th. And in my mind, I'm like, I got to have my people in the building for me. It just does something for you when someone is there morally supporting you, cheering you on versus if you're in the building by yourself with all these other people and all these other strangers and they got their family. You're like, well, what am I supposed to say? I, I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you there. So tell everybody what you're going to be getting your degree in, Kels. Well, this has probably been, whew, this has been the longest road ever. I think I started this in 2009. I took a break 2012, but 10 years later, I will be finishing up with my master's in business. So I will be a candidate. I will be a recipient of, uh, of an MBA. Congratulations. Awesome. 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 Thank you. Yeah, how the CEO is going to have for NBA, you know, so that's awesome. I mean, and that just shows, you know, um, it doesn't matter how long it takes. You can achieve your goals. Keisha Kelly did. It, you can, too. But um, let's jump right into the week's action. Oh, but also, before we talk about football, man, you're starting writing again. So let everybody know about your writing and where they can I read am. your <laughs> opinions. It, it took me a while, of course, and, mm-hmm. and I, I, think, I thank you because I know you've been trying to push me mm-hmm. for a while, and I've kind of been ignoring it for even mm-hmm. longer. But um, <laughs> I, I did decide to, to get back into my, as I call it, my journalism side um, and, and start uh, writing again. And I actually put out an article on Friday, and that first article was titled, um, well, it's under Black College Experience, and then the headline is More Than a Game. But this first article is The Future is Female, and you know I live by that. And it's yes, just a simple a article um, talking, you know, just simply talking about um, Althea Gibson and how, you know, how she was an athlete and how she started. And before there were the, the Williams sisters, um, there were the Althea Gibsons. But um, you can find that at blackcollegeexperience.blogspot.com. Yes, indeed. So make sure you go check that out. And also make sure you listen to us, like Kale says, on all our platforms, downloading the Black College Experience podcast. Leave us feedback. You know, we want to know what you guys think. Rate us on on, on Apple Podcasts. Let us know what you want to hear, what we're not doing well. We'll get it fixed. Trust me. We'll get it fixed. So, um, now, to jump into HBC. Oh, before we go that, what's going on, PP? My line brother on the phone. Calls in every week. How you doing, Fred? Oh, man, it was a nice little weekend. A lot of, you know, eye-opening games. Yes, 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 it was eye-opening games. No more eye-opening than the game that our CEO attended on yesterday. So, Kels, let everyone know of the game that you attended and how did it play out on the field for those two teams? Um, so yesterday I did. I had a chance to get out there and cover uh, Livingstone and Clark Atlanta. Um, I think I know myself personally. I picked Clark Atlanta, so I was wrong on my prediction. Um, uh, Livingstone did they did surprise. Now this is a funny thing. Uh, Miles Hayes had talked to uh, Stephen Gaither about I think on Thursday uh, with HBC game day, and he had said that they were going to get the W, and they in fact did, and. Um, it was it was some key plays with Clark Atlanta twice, two major plays that they just they didn't capitalize on, and of course that that caused um, Livingstone to to capitalize and to of course move on and move, win the game. But the thing is is that, and we we know you play the football is also not only is it a physical sport but it's also a mental sport, and if you go into these games feeling defeated, then you're not going to play your best ability. So, of course, I'm on Livingstone's bench. I'm on their side behind or on the side of their bench. And it's just the mentality. You're, you know, Clark Atlanta's playing at home, and they're all hyped up, and they all excited in front of all of their crowd. But Livingstone also had people travel down as well, as well as their band. So I'm over, and we're just kind of there, and they're just kind of 
going through the motions after Clark Atlanta scored one touchdown, one field goal, and it's just like their heads pain. I'm like, oh no, we, you know, you got to get into the group this thing. But I, I say, um, going into the second quarter, they hit their first touchdown and they were fine. And after that, they were pretty much gelling and steamrolling from that from that point. But they did end up winning this game again, 24 to 13. wasn't what um, wasn't what I expected. I know it wasn't what many of them expected. Got a chance to do an uh, interview, like I said, with the um, quarterback Miles, and he was talking about how it made them feel and, you know, what they were going to do the rest of the season as they take on Elizabeth City next week. And then I got a ch- we got a chance to do post-game with uh, Tim Bowles, head coach. To, uh, Right, and I also got a chance to re- listen to that interview that you had. I mean, the band was playing, and I'm pretty sure Mr. Uh, Hayes was tired. He completed 13 to 22 passes for 271 yards and count them one, two, three touchdowns to lead Livingstone to the victory. And I did pick Clark as well. I, I did not think Livingstone was going to beat Clark uh, on the ground. La Anderson the second. Had 86 yards in the air. Anthony Mullins had two catches for 94 yards, a 68 yard long, one touchdown. Brandon Duncan had one catch for 44 yards and a touchdown. And Anthony Brown had two catches for 30 yards and a touchdown for Livingstone. Now for Clark, pull this up here on the ground. Clark was led in rushing by Martin Fleming, who had two carries for 33 yards. In the air, Charles Stafford had it was eleven for thirty one. Not a good game for him. Two picks, one hundred fifty eight yards, and two touchdowns. In the air, they were led by Jakar Jerry, who had one catch for sixty four yards, going for a touchdown. Daryl Nichols had two catches for thirty yards and a touchdown. So, Kells, I mean, obviously, I've never been to a game on the campus of Clark. How was the atmosphere? I mean, did they have a how 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 was the atmosphere with the bands, the fans, with Livingstone coming into Atlanta? Oh, uh, with Livingstone coming into Atlanta, they brought their band. Their band is particularly a, a little bit bigger than um, Clark Atlanta, so um, that atmosphere really was. It was a great thing um, to have them come in. And like I said, even their fans, they had fans that came in and supported. So that was also a great thing. So. It was good to, to see that um, as, as the night rolled on. It was, it was really hot. It was very humid. But as the night rolled on, more Clark Atlanta fans came. And, you know, just to see both bands on both sides and then the crowd, you know, cheering on the fans and, you know, um, or cheering on the team, rather, was, it was just a great thing. And like I said, you know, um, talking to Coach uh, Tim Bowen of Clark Atlanta, you know, he talked about what they'll have to work on um, in the beginning, like starting on Monday or starting on tomorrow, rather. And he talked about, you know, going to practice things that they need to work on in different components. But, um, you know, there's, those are the first seasons. You know, everybody has the season openers, and these are things that you have to work on. And so the first game um, for them, you know, it's not how they expected it to be, but they did lose. And, of course, Livingstone went back to uh, Carolina with a W. Right, right. Um and this was Coach Bowen's first game as the head coach of CAU, his debut, which is a loss. Now, since we started out with a victory for the CIAA, we're going to run down this week's scores in the CIAA. Uh, Wingate defeated Johnson City Smith. Before, before you start the scores, let's go ahead and take a commercial break. All right, we'll be right back in 31 seconds with more Black College Experience. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. All right, we're back. We're more black out experience. Go ahead, kills. Okay, what's that? PP, is that your phone? Huh? I hear some feedback. Not mine. Okay. All right, so if you're just now tuning in, make sure you roll with the Black College Experience. Again, we're at 
6861, and that PIN number is 49170. All right, so we're going to run down the scores in the CIAA. Uh, again, Wingate defeats Johnson C. Smith 42 to 6. Lockhaven defeats Lincoln, Pennsylvania 57 to 13. Uh, UVA Wise defeats Chawan. Santa Raquel, Chawan or Chawan? Give me right now. It's it's so it's so one so one so one to twenty two, uh, Bowie State defeats American International College thirty four to twenty, and uh, if you if you participated in the Black College Experience HBCU football pick'em, you saw the last question was a familiar name for Bowie State. Just just Amir Hall is gone. We know Amir Hall was the do everything quarterback for Bowie State. I mean, two-time Black College National Player of the Year. Um, I just want to see what the quarterbacks are going to do in his absence, and they did not throw for over 250 yards. So if you chose that answer, you got those points. Um, But they did win the game with a dominating ground attack. So congratulations to Bowie State winning their first game in the after Amir Hall era or after A.H. era. Lenore Ryan defeated St. Augs, oh, wow, 68-7. There's a lot of big scores in this, in this league this week. DeCampo defeated Shaw, 38-14. Virginia Union defeated Hampton, 36-17. And that was a shocker, Kills. I mean, I, a lot of us picked Hampton because we saw what Hampton did last week. Hampton has the big-time transfer quarterback from Florida State. VUU said, we don't care who you brought in. We're going to whoop y'all. So what do you think about this upset, Kells? Virginia Union whipping Hampton 36-17. That's funny because I was just looking at that. Literally, as you were talking, I was looking at that. And, you know, somebody made the joke. They said, you know, they transferred. They said Hampton transferred to, to the Big South Conference. And they had the Big South money. And then you turn around and get beat by by HBCU where you still – or CIAA team is what they said. In, in, in hindsight, they're still both HBCU, still in the same thing, in my opinion. But – at the end of the day, they they beat them pretty good. They beat them pretty good, and that that was another thing. I think I think a lot of our predictions were just off this weekend. All of my predictions for football in NFL in NFL was going fine until here come the Cincinnati Bengals knocking me down. So I have been just off. I think this week off because from week to week we can't tell. There's been a lot of good stuff going on in football this weekend, and that that game right there with BU you and Hampton, like you said, I think we saw last week. It never would have been predicted for them to do what they did this week. Right, right. And speaking of picks, in the NFL season start today, you know, the only game I cared about was Kansas City, and we won. So, and I'm winning my fantasy game too, so I'm happy. Um, but rest of the games in the CIAA, uh, Norfolk State defeated Virginia State forty four twenty one. And, you know, that's a that's a HBCU versus HBCU battle, MEAC versus CRAA. And Norfolk Kells starting the season out strong. Um, what do you think about Norfolk State start? Okay, I think I was mad about that because I don't I can't remember. So I think I did pick Virginia. But Norfolk, or I can't remember, but I remember look, last week Norfolk was on the verge of an upset. Now, why I went against the grain, I have no idea. I don't know. But. Norfolk is beginning to pick up the pieces and piece them together, slowly but surely. So across the map, I think every conference is going to have some sleepers, and a lot of conferences are going to have some some people that upset some people Mm -hmm. that they had no clue about. It's going to affect how they end up playing at the end of the season. I definitely agree with you. Uh, Now, finishing off the scores, UNC Pembroke defeated Western State in the state 27-21. And Fayetteville State, another HBCU versus HBCU battle. This is CIAA versus SEAC. Uh, Fayetteville State defeated Benedict 35-21. to um, So, um, what do you think about this HBCU versus HBCU battle here? Yeah, I think I picked Benedict, so that tells you what I thought. I was completely wrong once again. Um, I don't know. I think this is what we're seeing. I think it's starting to be an underestimation of uh, the CIAA teams, I think there's also an underestimation of the SEAC teams. And what's happening is both sides, these teams are showing us, or excuse me, these conferences are showing us that they're stepping their game up to prove a point, that they, they can compete with uh, D, uh, D1 
even with them being D2 and other conferences. So I think that it's, it's just showing us that you can't take anybody lightly because it, any given Saturday, not Sunday, any given Saturday, anybody can win. And then we're seeing wins like 30, 40 points over the competitors. Mm-hmm. And the last game was canceled due to weather. Uh, Allen at, at Elizabeth City State. So we also want to send prayers um, to anybody impacted by Hurricane Dorian. Uh, I myself have been impacted by hurricanes since 2005. Every year they come, especially as I decide to move to Louisiana. Instead of staying away, I can move closer. And, you know, so I definitely can understand uh, what the individuals uh, who were impacted by Hurricane Dorian in North Carolina and Georgia and also in the Bahamas. So I want to send prayers to those individuals. Uh, and, they- yeah, why, and while you're there, um, there, there was there was a Savannah State um, volleyball student uh, by the name of Carissa Tatum that was killed on her way oh, wow. to um, to North Georgia. She was traveling to North Georgia, and her car hydroplane struck a tree while she was evacuating from her from Hurricane Dorian. So, you know, it's, it, it is it's very tragic, very tragic. Yes, 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 yes. So, um, uh, that's very, very that's something that just sticks with me. Uh, when it comes to hurricanes, because, I mean, we can't really fight the wind and the water. All we can do is hope to survive it. So, um, ready to jump to the swag? Sure. All right, now, in the swag, I mean, we had a lot, a lot of good games. And first up, let's see who's going to be the first to come up here. First up is your Jags on the road taking on the Memphis Tigers. And Memphis defeated Ole Miss, yay, last week. Um, your Southern Jaguars fell to uh, Maine State last week. All uh, those turnovers. Southern World came up with the win. But now this this game, I'm pretty sure Memphis did not think to get a lot of fight from Southern. But they got a lot of fight from Southern kills. Talk about the Jaguars' performance versus the Tigers. Um, I think that Southern is going to be okay if we can clean up special teams. Now, last week it's like, all right, let's talk in the turnover. If we can clean up special teams, I think we'll be fine um, in the West, in the conference here. But I think we'll be fine. We just got we still got to tweak some things and, and clean up some things. And as we start getting closer, as we start getting into that more HBCU play and then into conference play, we'll definitely have to uh, clean that up. And as I joked yesterday and as we said, um, I'm, I'm actually proud that I can say that my Jaguars, even though we fell 24 to 55, we still put up more points on University of Memphis than Ole Miss did sure last did. week. So let that sink in, people. Let that sink in. And like somebody else said, you know, with um, our HBCU, we are getting close. It, it's not, it ain't happened yet, but it's getting closer and closer and closer when we just start saying, upset and I waited patiently last night for Valley to do it. I was in the middle of the <laughs> walking and tweaking, walking and tweaking in overtime. And they blowing the horn and I'm acting like I don't hear nobody because I was waiting on the upset. It's three points. You know it, I was we're getting there. We we getting there. We are getting there. And I've been saying this for three years and you know it. My only prayer is for everybody in the slack to be competitive. And this looks exactly. like the season to do it if we can pull Texas Southern into the ring. Come on, Texas Southern. You're holding <laughs> everybody back. You're holding everybody back. All right, let's run down stats for the Jaguars. Darius Skelton, of course, led the Jags in passing with 86 yards and one touchdown through the air. On the, he also led the Jaguars in rushing with 75 yards, followed up by Devon Ben with 36 yards, Jamal Washington with 22 yards, and a touchdown. Through the air, the Jags were led by Hunter Register with two catches for 48 yards. T. Bedford for two catches for 22 yards. Cameron Mackey and Jeremiah Houston with one catch apiece for 13 and 4 yards, respectively. Houston had the long passing touchdown. And Christopher Cheney had two catches for three yards. Now, jumping over to the next game versus an FBS opponent, the Grambling State University Tigers kills. Now, that's your, that's your conference rival, but I'm pretty sure you were cheering for them to pull this upset. And Grambling, after falling down 20 to nothing, stormed back in the second half. And, you know, what do you think about this game, Kills, as far as Grambling showing that, hey, 
we got knocked down, but we're going to come back and punch you in the mouth. And that's exactly what they did to lose them tech. They came back and punched the Bulldogs in the mouth and fell just short a touchdown. Touchdown and extra point short of pulling off the upset at, uh, on the road against the Louisiana Tech. Nope, I absolutely do not cheer for the for the uh, for the enemy. I don't because we're still going to have to get into conference play. We still got to play by you class. So I I never cheer for Grambling. I, I don't. Sorry, I do not. I, I'm not cheering for them. Like, oh, come I, on, I don't kills. Do this, nope, I do not. And I don't. That's the thing about me. I don't stagger. I don't change. I don't. I don't change for who I am. I don't care. I'm not, I'm not cheering for y'all. I'm not because they wouldn't cheer for Southern. So, but honestly, all, all jokes aside. Um, Hickenbottom, he was moving the ball. That was that, that he kept moving the ball, and 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 their number seven. We you know prayers to their number seven because he did get hurt, and it was it was a situation, yes. and the, the pitchers did not look good. But you know we were one hill, but seriously, we have to stick together. And you hate to see any of those athletes get hurt, but he was for some reason they were moving the bottom, uh, moving the ball, moving the ball, and they were doing a lot of great things. Just they just could not capitalize on the red zone. Now for the for the fact that they did come back, I gotta give them props on that coming back. And you 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 made it what a one score game. That that was awesome. And if they you know you live by if it was more time, if 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 somebody had to live on your premises right now, if it was more time, they might have won the game. Exactly. And now also you gotta look at this now. This is the second straight FBS opponent that Grambling has been able to move the ball on the ground on. Normally, when an HBCU plays an FBS opponent now, you know. Uh, Louisiana Tech and ULM are not top tier FBS opponents, but they're still FBS. Grambling was able to move the ball on the ground. As far as on the ground through the air, Hickenbottom had 239 yards and one touchdown on the ground. Grambling outgained Louisiana Tech 216 to 170. So that lets you know that Grambling offensive line is not playing around. They're going to run the ball this year. And who better than run the ball than a, a head coach who was a running back? So he wants to get back to his roots and running the ball. Led by Damian Crumney with 68 yards. Jeremy Heckenbottom with 58. Jakari Nichols with 48. Kalen Elder with 26. Dequarius Bruton with 10. And Nichols had the long touchdown on the ground for the Tigers in the air. Uh, Raylan Richardson had 63 yards on the touchdown, followed up by Lyndon Rash with seven catches for 57 yards. Devontae Davis had four, five catches for 46, and Quentin Geis had three catches for 31. So, you know, here's the thing. What, what a lot of SWAC fans are hoping for is these early games of SWAC schools competing at a high level, even before faltering or competing and coming back. It's going to showcase, it may bode well for when we get into SWAC, MEAC, SEAC, and CIAA season. Because if you can play well out of conference, you're just fine-tuning yourself. You're trying to see what you can do. So, it was good to see Gramlin fight back. Uh, Up next, Tuskegee versus Alabama State. Now, these SEAC schools have been given the SWAC. Holy hell, kills! Last week, Morehouse almost beat Alabama A&M. Alabama A&M needed a miracle pass at the last minute to defeat Morehouse. Alabama State needed, only scored seven points in the fourth quarter, and that was the difference. 38-31, to 31, uh, defeating Tuskegee. Kells, what do you think about Hornets win over the Golden Tigers? Um, the funny thing is, is that we joke all the time, but – Coach Slater has Tuskegee ready, and Tuskegee um, Tuskegee is just one of those, as you say, monkeys on the back that Alabama State really can't shake. And it's like every year um, they're they're ready, and they're going to they're going to it back to back to back to back, and that's the first game for them. And so every year they go down this same path, and they have this same conversation, and so. Alabama State is so excited. Uh, Tuskegee is excited. And I think that gives them a lot of um, – that gives them a lot of heart on both sides because, well, with Tuskegee, they're excited to see, you know, what, what they're going to be up against. And it kind of gives them the momentum of what they're going to be facing in their own conference in the SEAC. So it gets them pretty excited um, in, in what they're doing on their actual game day. And, of course, you know, you get the trash talking back and forth and everybody's talking about who going to do what and, you know, um, 
who's going to win the game and how it's going to end. And they do. They talked about how they felt like they got robbed last year. And they were like, you know, we coming back. Um, and this year we're going to actually win the game. Um, and we're going to do some different things. So um, this year, you know, there there's a kid I actually interviewed. Can't call his last name, but uh, first name, but last name's Wynn. And I got a chance to talk to them, and he talked about it. He was like, you know, we felt like we were robbed last year. And they just said it was like, you know, when we play Alabama State, that game is lit. And so to see that, and these kids are super excited, and then you walk away. So every year it's, it's on the hinges between these two teams. And I think it's a really good – I think it's a really good time to be out there at that Labor Day Classic. Right. PP, I see you back. What do you think about this game, Alabama State versus Tuskegee? Yeah, I picked us to to win because I know that every year is gonna be a it's gonna be a close game no matter what. It don't matter about the what is it the division levels and all that. It it's always gonna be a close game. So yeah, you I, know, Tuskegee always gonna they gonna fight get hard. Up for, yeah, they are gonna always get up for Alabama State. All right, now just running down the stats. Now this quarter, there's a quarterback at Alabama State that wasn't even mentioned for our SWAC preseason. Uh, honors and his name is Kadaris Davis. He has lit up the scoreboards the past couple of weeks. He threw for 347 yards, four touchdowns, and one pick on the ground. The Jack, though, I'm sorry, the Hornets were led by Duran Bell with 63 yards and one touchdown uh, through the air. Michael Jefferson had five catches for 174 and three touchdowns. Jeremiah Hickson had eight for 116 and a touchdown. Uh, the Tigers were led by uh, Ahmad Doremus with 177 yards on in the air, and Jamarcus Ezel with 33 yards and the long touchdown through the air. Tarian Taylor ran for 78 yards and two touchdowns on the ground uh, through the air. Peyton Ramsey had six catches for 108 and one touchdown. So, you know, those are the leaders for Alabama State versus Tuskegee. Up next, kills got to talk about this Alcorn State whooping of Mississippi College. Now, we know Mississippi College – uh, is a, I think they're a Division three school. So, Alcorn showed no mercy. Or oh, did they move up, PP? Yeah, they moved up a couple okay. years ago to D2. Okay, so yeah, they're D2 now. Alcorn didn't care. They whooped them. Uh, of course, <laughs> um, that is in Clinton, Mississippi. But the game was played in Lorman. Um, so, Alcorn, 45-7 to seven over Mississippi College. Um the Braves were led by Noah Johnson with 132 yards in the air and one touchdown on the ground. Nico Duffy led the Braves with 138 yards and two touchdowns. Uh, Deshaun Waller had 77, 71 yards and one touchdown. And Kevon Marsh, Alcorn, is playing everybody with 70 yards and on the ground. So, you know, Alcorn is just fine-tuning itself for swag season through the air. The Braves were led also by Nico Duffy with three catches for 38 yards and one touchdown, and Deshaun Waller with four catches for 35 yards. So the Braves showing no mercy. So, uh, Kels, PP, what do you think about Alcorn? Just they're the preseason swag champ favorite. So what do you think about – do you do you want to put anything on this that's just saying that Alcorn should have beaten Mississippi College like this? Of course, I mean, you, you talk about a team that went from D3 to D2. It's just like somebody made the joke yesterday. They were like, oh, let's talk about Southern. Yeah, but y'all basically playing a junior college. So let's not act like this is somebody of a, a large caliber. You're supposed to be. Like I said, I said, okay, so y'all basically got a variety child playing as a joke. But seriously, you can't take anything from all four. Um, being a preseason favorite, they're coming back and they're, they're not only they're playing that team in that way, but they're going to play every SWAT team in a hard manner as well. They're, they're ready to play. And, uh, again, you, you have Noah Johnson. You have uh, Solomon Muhammad. You have all of these guys that, that's coming out and they're ready. So they're just showing us. That was just an example of what they're going to do. But um, Alcorn is going to be, as my dad used to say, they're going to be the book of bear. They're going to be the person to be in the conference for everybody. They're, they're going to be that thing. They're going to be that team. It's going to be a, it's going to be tough, but they're going to be that team to beat this season. Now, this next game we're going to talk about is near and dear to PP and my's heart, and that is our Dutch Devils was taking on the Lamar Cardinals, and I think the Cardinals were I think ranked number twenty one in FCSP. Twenty one, yeah, yeah. So our Dutch Devils gave them 
We are we almost beat them. We lost twenty three to twenty. The Cardinals needed a field goal in overtime to defeat the Delta Devils. Uh, the Delta Devils were led by the Jerry Bryant with ninety one yards through the air, one touchdown and one costly interception. Bryant also led us on the ground with one hundred twenty seven yards and two touchdowns. John Derrick Smith carried the ball twelve times for thirty nine yards uh, through the air. We were led by Johnny Wilson with fifty one yards and one touchdown, and Jarius Clayton with thirty one yards. Now PP. Uh, did you get a chance to catch this game? Yeah, bits and pieces. All right, so talk about what do you think about how do we perform in this game as far as should the sweat be on notice because we almost beat Tennessee State, and here we are in a dog fight with the number 21 ranked team in FCS. For years, we would have been the doormat of the SWAT, but these first two games should the SWAT be on notice. Yeah, I mean, I I don't think we're gonna be sneaking up on it. Like this, this is the third straight. Like I said this is the third straight close loss we've had. Turkey Day Classic at the end of last season, and then these two games. But it's like, right, well, okay, let's see. If people might say, okay, Tennessee State, well, that was a fluke, but whatever. We played them tough. We snuck up on them. Lamar was. I think they were prepared. You know, they had game film and all that, and. What did we do? We led. We was leading them with under three minutes left in the game. Had the ball, and the defense just, I mean, it was just a defensive, you know, battle all throughout the game or whatever. And the big thing for, the, like, the third straight game, we got to learn how to uh, close games. We got to learn how to close games. We're on, we had our first turnover of the season. But, you know, still a pretty overall clean game. I think the defense, is, what is it, we held them to 23 points, held Tennessee State to 26 points. So the defense is much improved. So it's going to, I mean, people are now on notice now. So we we played Bethune close last year, so we know we can't sneak up on them. The big test is going to be in Lorman on the 28th. That's going to be the, I mean, we're coming out the gate going against the Beast of the East. Beast of the East is what Alcorn definitely has been. Um, we have another guest on, and this is a very, very special guest, and she is the winner of our Week 2 Media Pick'em, and that is none other than Jennifer Murray of Alabama A&M. What's going on, Jen? Hey, guys. How are y'all doing? The champ is here. Hey, guys. Nothing, Jen. You, y'all messed up my picks yesterday, too. I'm saying it. The my champ whole is here. <laughs> so, Jen, you are the two-time, <laughs> two-time champ. You won week one, and you won week two. So, man, can you give me the lottery numbers, man, since you're picking so good? I mean, I... I, I just kind of, you know, well, some of them were, some of them was wishes, but, um, I mean, kind of like guesses, but most of the time it's just really like looking at the match matchups and, you know, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each team. Um, however, I'm still in shock about one particular game last week, but, um, uh, <laughs> are you talking yeah. about your Bulldogs? I mean, to be honest, I knew it was going to be some challenges because of um, we're under a new defensive coordinator. Um, did not expect over 600 uh, total yards of offense. Um, did not expect that. But, um, you know, it's still early in the season, and we definitely have um, – we, 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 you know, we're still in this thing. We, uh, we have room for growth, and it's good that we identified our issues up front instead of finding them out later on in the season. Well, here's the thing, you know, we our school has been known as the doormat of the East lately. The doormat of the West has been Arkansas Pine Bluff, and boy, did they kick the door in on you guys. 52 to 34, like you said, over 600 yards of total offense. Run down the stats uh, for the Golden Lions. Uh, Shannon Patrick threw for 196 yards and three touchdowns. Skylar Perry had 109 yards and three touchdowns. Really, the Golden Lions could have stopped playing right then and there. Uh, On the ground, 
Keyshawn Williams ran, ran for 206 yards. Taylor Porter ran for 117 yards and one touchdown. Uh, through the air, Harry Battle the third had four catches for 113 yards and three touchdowns. DeWan Miller had 72 yards and one touchdown. And Tyron Ralph had 28 yards and one touchdown. And Jeremy Brown had the last touchdown catch uh, on the evening for Arkansas Pine Bluff. Your Bulldogs, led by Akil Glass, he had 352 yards through the air, two touchdowns and one interception on the ground. Jordan Bentley had 108 yards and two touchdowns. Gary Kors also had 32 yards and one touchdown on the ground through the air for your Bulldogs. Make sure I'm saying this right, Jen. Abdul Fatah Ibrahim. I believe that's right. Okay. I struggle with it too. He led <laughs> the Bulldogs with nine catches for 142 yards and two touchdowns. So, like, Jen, I, I know you're a proud Bulldog because, you know, you always, you stay fast. So, how, I mean, what did you do? Did you panic when you saw Arkansas Pine Bluff just scoring at will against your defense? Um, well, there was some concern. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, um, well, there were some uh, issues I identified last week um, against Morehouse um, and with our defense. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, if you notice, I, um, you know, a little quiet leading up to this week because I did <laughs> see how uh, UAPB played against TCU. So, um, you know, they played a really uh, great game against the Power 5 F- uh, FBS school. So, yeah, there was, you know, some concerns. Um, I do, I will say this. Um, I definitely think UAB, uh, UAPB is not the team that we have, you know, you know, have assumed they've been for the last uh, few years. They're definitely a different team. It's like, and like you said, Valley, Valley definitely has some improvements um, as well. So just this game here shows us that um, the swag is not, you know, what we take it for. It's, um, it's not business as usual. Anyone can get it. So, I just, you know, I would, you know, let everyone know that, you know, any Saturday, be ready. All right. Now, jumping back to uh, Texas Southern versus Incarnate Word Cardinals, um, SWAC versus the Southland Conference, and we didn't fare too well in this game. Uh, Law six. Wait, 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 because she dared just ain't ask me nothing when I thought about Alabama. Oh, I'm A&M. sorry, CEO. Your turn. It- is okay, so let's go back. Brian Jenkins no, Jenkins got hurt at one point in the game. And then I think he came back. I guess I just want to say is he okay? Because I know he got hurt at one point during the game. And I think they said he was coming back. But I didn't hear the final on what happened. Well, I, I'm not sure either. So let's hope that he is able to play next week because he is a very dynamic wide receiver for the Bulldogs, reeling in a game-winning catch against Morehouse. So um, definitely we need him to be playing this year because with a player like him playing, that helps the Swag's brand. It helps Alabama and ms team. So uh, hopefully he will be able to come back and play uh, next week. Um, so I'll just, just wish prayers for him and any player that was injured. Hopefully your injury isn't too serious. Come back and play next week. But if you are injured, I'm going to be out yes, press for a very, 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 very quick recovery. Amen. Amen. All right. Anything else on Pine Bluff Kills? No, it just, it just messed up my pick. That's it. My bad. That's it. Bad. <laughs> it, it did. I mean, but no, seriously, I had a chance to the, – the crazy thing is during Swag Media Day, I got a chance to interview Coach Thomas, and for people that don't know, their athletic director is Melvin Hines, which used to be athletic director at Alabama State, which he's from Huntsville, Alabama. That's how I know Melvin. So Melvin actually sat in and done the interview, the first part of the interview, because Coach Thomas had walked out to, like, the bathroom or something, and then he came back. And Coach Thomas is just kind of like the quiet person. He kind of don't have any words. I kind of had to pull the words out of him. But he was talking about what they were going to do and how they were going to complete some games, and boom, then they pop up and do this. So, yeah, I think 
Somebody said, there, we, we laughing at a and yesterday. I'm going to tell you, some of us going to be crying later on in the season, too. Some of us going to be in the same position. They are going to do something to some people that – because we got to go down to Pine Bluffs to play, too. Uh-huh. Y'all had them at home. Southern had to travel to them. So it's going to be some, some upsets, some more upsets in this season that nobody said. And I'm, I'm going to be looking forward to – because some of us don't get drugged as well. Right. Yeah, um, I will say this. I am, you know, you hate for it to be your team, but right. I am excited for uh, the future of the SWAT, um, especially when it came to play against the outside conferences. The SWAT really put some some really great efforts across the board against um uh, against other uh, FPS competition as well as FBS competition. Correct. So. This year, buckle up your seatbelt. Um, like I said, nothing is guaranteed. Anything can happen. So we, so that right. gonna be Alabama and them. You said what? That are gonna be Alabama and them. <laughs> now I didn't say all that. Now, like I said, we <laughs> we gonna make some improvements. So come over here with that. <laughs> I couldn't help myself, man, because you know we play y'all. This. We don't play Southern. Kind of glad we don't. But, you know, we play y'all because you're all in our division. So, we're definitely going to see y'all a new, improved, valid team. And I do know that the football team is definitely not overlooking y'all. I, 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 I tell you what, this is what I, I want to happen. To I the, want the, uh, the locker room myself. I want the defense that showed up against UFAB to show up when we play y'all. Can you just let, let them don't come back? <laughs> all right, just to, just to cap off this loss to Econata Word. You know, we had offensively Texas Southern put up a lot of points, forty-four points, but just had no defense. Offensively, led by DeAndre Johnson with three hundred thirty-one yards and three touchdowns and one pick. Uh, Devin Williams also had a touchdown pass on the ground. Ladarius Owens had ninety-four yards and two touchdowns through the air. Trendavian Dixon had a big game. He ate up the incarnate word defense. For eight catches, 221 yards, and two touchdowns. So, you know, watch out for Texas Southern's offense. They did score against Prairie View, just could not stop them. They scored against Incarnate Word, just could not stop them. Uh, up next, because I'm pretty sure no one wants to talk about that. We need to move on. Uh, Jackson State um, loses to South Alabama. No mascot hijinks this game, y'all. Um, but Coach Henry did settle on a quarterback. Derek Ponder played the whole game. He threw for 123 yards, one touchdown, and one interception. On the ground, the Tigers were led by Kishon Harper with 75 yards. Taiwan Alexander, 44 yards, and one touchdown. Through the air, Kylan Ritchie led the Tigers with four catches for 46 yards. And Kenan Young had 27 yards. So, uh, Kells, Jack State, traveled to Mobile to play against South Alabama. You're an Alabama girl. What do you think about Jackson State's performance? Well, they keep saying that they're impressed. Jackson State said they're impressed with uh, the way they're playing. If you look yeah. at the yards and things that they're doing, it, it is. It's just that they're not capitalized. Of course, they're not. I mean, I don't think any of us predicted them to win. But um, I, I do. Every year, y'all know I keep on saying that this is going to be Jackson State. It's been Jackson State year for me for like three years in a row. And Jackson State got to come through for me this year because I keep on saying I picked two teams to watch in the SWAC this year, and it's Jackson State and a and Both of y'all can't disappoint me. And somebody got to do it. I said a and and Jackson State were going to be the two teams that everybody should watch. Look like it's going to be Valley and Pine Bluff. That's look right. Like I, look, like I, look like it's going to be Valley and Pine Bluff. Yeah, but, be, uh, we might wait to the SWAC uh, championship this year. So you get the way you said all that, though. See, we, you, we, you, we ain't said all that. We ain't said nowhere near that. It's, hey, it's a possibility. Everybody, I think everybody, with the exception of Texas Southern, might actually have a chance. So, seriously, I, I do. Jackson State, from last week, and you, you talked about the you talked about the mascot, from last week, when they, I don't know what that was that they had going on last week with Bethune Cookman, and then you come into this week, I don't know, but they played Tennessee State this week, and that's going to be a very interesting game going against Coach Reed, because Tennessee State struggled with Mississippi Valley. Sure did. So I want to see what they do this week against Jackson State. Speaking of Tennessee State, um, they did play against uh, Middle Tennessee State, and they put up 
you know, they lost the game. They lost for the game by 20-some points. Then the final score was 44-24, I think. So they did play uh, an improved game against the, an FBS opponent than they played against us. So uh, I am going to be paying attention to the Jackson State Tennessee State game because if Jackson State struggles against Tennessee State, I get to pick at the Tigers. You know, because, hey, we didn't struggle as much as y'all did if they struggled. So we'll have to wait and see. But um, the last game in the SWAC, before we jump over into MEAC, uh, is Prairie View against Houston. And uh, I, I have to say, I, I was sh- watching Houston's de- offense and defense against mm-hmm. Oklahoma, uh, I just thought Prairie View would be able to score more points against Houston because Prairie View does have a very, very explosive offense. But they were limited to 17 points. Uh, Kels, what do you think about the Panthers' loss to Houston, 37-13? So, I'm sorry, 17. You know what? I, I think I was expecting more points because last year they actually did better towards that thing. They they had moments where they, they – I think they might have led maybe once last year, and then, of course, they ended up with, coming away with the L. It was more times than once that it actually was a situation as to where they were close to winning last year. So, I thought this year I thought they would be close. And then would they beat them? No. But I thought it would have been a lot closer than what it was. Same here, same here. Jen, Prairie versus uh, yeah. Houston. Um, ooh, well, I actually wanted to go to that game. But um, I decided to work overtime instead. <laughs> but um, Make that money, make that money, man. <laughs> um, well, I, I will say this. Um, Definitely um, proud of the effort that Prairie View put up against uh, Houston. Um, definitely, they kept it. Um, they definitely kept the game in range. So again, um, like I said, Tucker, Tucker's a problem, and if you cannot contain him, he's going to run all over the swag. So. Yes, indeed. So. And I do. I, I like, I, and I like him. That was Do- Dorian was one of those people that he took off last year in Swag Miac Challenge or Miac Swag Challenge when they played uh, North Carolina Central. I guess you'll say he ran all over North Carolina Central, kind of like Tariq ran all over. Okay, next subject. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> but uh, now we're ready to jump over to the Miac, and you know. I was glad to see Howard wake up after getting beat to sleep by Maryland. Um, they did play against FCS Power, Youngstown State. And even though Howard lost, they did put up a fight. They woke up. They scored some points. And led by Kaylee Newton with 266 yards passing, two touchdowns. He also led them on the ground with 48 yards. So, Kels, what do you think about Howard waking up, scoring some points against Youngstown State? Ooh, it looked it looked a lot better than it did last week. You you hate to be drug like that, and then you hate to be drug on national TV. So I'm glad they did because I think it goes back to that conversation that we had when they were talking. They were saying that um, that Kalen was just an athlete instead of a quarterback, and I think that's still kind of ringing in my mind too because it's a slap in the face um, to to actually say such things about him. So. You know, it 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 was it like I said, it looks a lot better than it did last week. Exactly. So, Jen, how was performance against Youngstown State? Um, I was um, well, definitely an improvement um against Maryland. Of course, um, Young Youngstown State is a FBS power, but like uh, Keisha was talking about, uh, Caleb, you know, he had some pretty decent numbers. Uh. Over 250 yards, um, two touchdowns, um, just one interception, you know, definitely an improvement across the board, especially with their offense. So, Howard, um, Howard can be in a good uh, position to be a challenger in the MEAC, but, you know, we'll have to see. All right, next up is North, no, we are talking about North University of Virginia State, South Carolina State. Fresh off an upset of his own, blanking lane out of the sea at Coach Buddy Pooh 
Everyone's trying to say that he should retire. Coach Buddy said, I ain't ready to go nowhere yet. What y'all think about this blowout win by South Carolina State? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't think anybody was surprised that they were going to beat Lane. I now thirty four zero. Yeah, that sound about right. I don't think I was surprised whatsoever. Looking at what Lane has done, I don't think I was surprised at all. Jen, again, not surprised. Um, it would have been nice if Lane scored, but um, they literally rolled over. Um, and I think the Division Two can be more competitive, but just not in this case. All right. Next up, we're gonna talk about. Oh man, uh, this is this is one of our biggest hopes of beating FBS squads, and you know, <laughs> taking on in-state uh, sister school Duke, uh, the North Carolina Anti Aggies uh, got ran off the field, forty-five to thirteen. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, Duke is much improved. They're not the Duke of old on the football field. So uh, maybe it was wrong with me to 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 think that North Carolina NT could could beat them because Duke did stay toe to toe with Alabama for a while uh, before the game got away late, and they kind of took their frustrations out on the Aggies. But it was good to see the Aggies continue to fight in the game. Uh, Kels, uh, talk about what do you think about the outcome of this game, and then we can move on. I saw, I talked to an Aggie last night, and I said, well, at least y'all did score. And they like y'all was completely blank. And it, it wasn't at 45, ain't, ain't 65 is what I said. So they did score. They did a kick. Um, but uh, North Carolina a t is, is one of those teams as well that we see them, what they keep on doing to their opponents, uh, FBS opponents, over and over again. And they, they are. Again, they're predicted, of course, to be the favorite in their conference. Um, but uh, as far as effort, I think um, they had great effort. And, of course, once they get into their conference play, they're going to be in trouble. I definitely yeah. agree. Go ahead, Jen. I agree with that. And also, um, North Carolina a has a great kicking game. And um, even though, of course, they only scored 13 against Duke, um, having a strong field goal kicker makes the difference. It absolutely does. It absolutely does because that's going. That's a lot of times that's your determining factor. That's your yeah. determining factor. All right. Next up in the MIAC, huh, another another um, beatdown, I guess you could say, a uh, thousand versus North Carolina Central. Kels, forty-two to three loss by North Carolina Central. No comment. Jen. <laughs> what y'all eat for dinner tonight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, come on! All right, now we're ready to jump over to the to the um, SEAC. But first, uh, the first game I want to talk about in the SEAC is Kentucky State's upset win on yesterday. Let's see, get this pulled up here. Uh, Kentucky State defeated Robert Morris, a Division One FCS opponent. 13 to 7. They scored 13 on their points to secure the win. Jen, you first. What do you think about Kentucky State's upset of the of the division? I, I am proud of them. And honestly, Kentucky State, to me, I they're gonna cause some trouble in the uh SIEC. I if I, you know, whether you know their favorites like the Miles and Tuskegee, I will be on the lookout. I really would. Kels? I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you said. The change, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was just saying, like, to me, um, Kentucky State is a huge favorite for me to um, do well in the SIAC. If I was the, you know, perennial favorites like Tuskegee and Miles, I would be concerned. Right. Um. For Kentucky State, uh, first year because they had, they're coming in with a first year coach. It is switch coaches, so I'm not really, I'm not really concerned. I think I'll say what year, year and a half, uh, two years ago when they did beat Tuskegee. I, me personally, I think it was a fluke, but um, I, I really won't. I and mean, Jackson State's going to play them too. I really, in Kentucky State, I wouldn't be so concerned. Miles and Tuskegee will be my biggest concerns in this conference, in the SEAC rather. All 
All right. Now yeah. going down the rest of the scores in the SEAC, as we are about out of time, uh, we might not have a chance to give our analysis. Uh, but as I give each score, I'll just give uh, – we'll alternate. You give your opinion on the victory for each school. Uh, Kills Miles versus Fort Valley. 38 uh, Miles, to 17. Oh, I thought you were asking me next week. I would say, oh, Miles. <laughs> yeah, 38. So, again, Miles is one of those teams that you have to be concerned with. And the funny thing is, is what Coach Ruffin said, we, well, we won the, the conference last year, or we won the championship last year, and that's, you know, that that's in the past. But, no, they I think they play maybe more house Nick. But they I, I think Miles is going to be the concern for the conference this year. They started out rocky, and like we were talking about how teams can affect how other teams end up playing. That's how theirs played out. And it's not how you start, but how you finish. And we've seen how they finish. Miles is going to be the concern for the CA. All right, Jen. Queensland University defeating the Central State 38-8. to uh, Not surprised. All right. Kells, Valdosta defeating Albany State 38-3. to yeah, they, I mean, they every time they play, it's it's always not it's not a good thing. So that's that's not a surprise um, when they do that. They actually, coach actually says that that's just something to get the guys going um, to make them feel good. But no, no surprise here. All right, and Morehouse over Edward Waters, J- Kales. Okay, so I had a chance to actually talk to a couple of Morehouse people, and they said that they really played sloppy. And if you if watch it in the beginning, um, it, it was. It, it was slow play. Uh, it was 0-9 in the beginning. Uh, nine went to – then it went 9-6. Uh, they did end up pulling it out 20-26 over uh, Edward Waters, but they, they did sluggish and sloppy play. Um, it almost cost them the game, but um, they, they are. They're going to have to tighten up. Morehouse uh, is really going to have to tighten up. All right, for our last game. Yeah, I, uh, oh, ahead, I agree. Uh, I'm sorry. I agree. Uh, Morehouse, uh, as well as they played against us, they should have blown out at Waters. A six-point win against their Waters is not good. Sure, yeah. Coach Ruffin building a little juggernaut over there. He be getting them sleeper picks that people don't be knowing about. So y'all better watch out for Ed Waters. Kells, they coming to Jaguar Land this Saturday. So I will be happy. And that's all they're going to do is come to Jaguar Land. That's all they're going to do. <laughs> They're going to take some pictures. They're going to come on campus and that's it. They are on the road for four weeks or four games starting Saturday. They're going to come to Mumford. That's all they're going to do is show up. That's it. <laughs> and our last game, Jen, this is for you, the norm, number 14, Langston Lions, ekes out a 21-20 win over McPherson College. Um, Again, I think Langston, um, great win for them. I know um, we're, you know, excited about the perennial strengths, but I think it's a few more dark horses, and um, and it's actually AC and I different thing like since one of them. All right, Kills, go ahead and close us out. All right, well, we appreciate everybody for rolling with us this week. It has had been a great weekend. Tune in with us next week. So we'll see who's going to be doing what, who's going to be upsetting who. And as Edward Waters roll on to the bluff, and they think they're going to do something. My Jaguars are opening up at home, the home opener next week. So hopefully um, it is. This is the Pete Richardson Classic. So it's the second annual Pete Richardson Classic, the Dean of Quack. So um, hopefully we can we can get um, we can get a, a sellout, a nice crowd, and hopefully everybody's doing what they do. Um, actually, I'm going I'm to kind of propel a little bit ahead. I'm actually kind of excited I was going to do G-Ho this year. I was going to go watch North Carolina A&T and uh, Howard play. But this year I'm going to do Magic City Classic because I want to see what the uh, Hornets and the Bulldogs are going to do. Yes, so I want to see who's going to do what. This is going to be the most trash talking ever. And before we get out of here, i got to uh, give a shout-out to our Week 2 fan pick em champion, Ryan Baxter. It's this week's Week 2 HBCU fan pick em champion. He... Scored 28 points to take home the crown. I was hoping Ryan could have called in, but he wasn't able to. But still want to give him his shout out. Um, he did. He is a soul champion. Last week we had two champs, Chad Jones and Al Rice. This week we had one champ. So um, be on the lookout for the week three pick em poll, uh, pick em, um pick em site. I'm going to be working on that tonight and tomorrow. It'll be live and available sometime tomorrow. And but may the picks be in your favor, Kills. <laughs>